Hey friends, how you doing? I got a returning guest with me today. I have uh, Jason Pritchard with me one more time. How you doing this afternoon, Jason? I'm great, Zuber. How are you, man? I'm doing very well. Before we get into the meat of the presentation, I do want to uh, talk about and congratulate you on three things. First cool. and foremost, you and your office mates ran a half marathon over the weekend, which is mighty impressive. Congratulations. We did. We did. Yeah, we, uh, we uh, put something out to the office, I think maybe like a month and a half ago, two months ago, and we had four or five people sign up. And uh, we made it uh, in one piece. Yeah, but a uh, little sore still a few days later, but it was fun. <laughs> You're not as young as you used to be, my friend. <laughs> That's right. That's and the body didn't bounce back like I thought it would, but uh, we made it. There you go. And then second, um, one of the things that I acknowledged in my book that I got wrong that I'm happy to see that you and your wife are enjoying is I believe you're every 90 days you're getting away for a little break. Um, yes, we, my Jennifer and my, uh, Jennifer and I, my wife, um, we made a commitment almost two years ago that we were going to try to travel every 90 days just because both of our lives are so busy with our kids and work and just all the things that we're trying to juggle. And, uh, it just, it's made it hard to, uh, find time to connect. And, um, we leverage a lot of just credit card points using, uh, you know, all of the different travel rewards and things that are out there. So we run all of our expenses, uh, through that for the business and all our personal stuff. We pay those down at the end of the month and we rack up just a ton of points. And so it's allowed us to fly and stay at some nice hotels for free. And so that's what we do. Well, I'm very, I'm very happy to see that you're doing that. I wish, I, A, I wish more people had the flexibility to do that. Uh, and the ones that do have the flexibility, I wish we would do that more often. Um, you know, I gonna... think it is just like anything else, Michael. It's a, it's a, a mindset shift. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought that we would have had the time to do it, you know, at the beginning. Yeah. And I think whatever is important, you make time for it. And it's funny how it always kind of works itself out in the end. So, yeah. And then lastly, uh, you closed out last year with 25 doors, as I recall, and you were just on a tear here through the early parts of April, uh, with a fourplex and eight plex, I think, and, and some others. So where, where are you at today, Jason? So that, so it's funny kind of how the dust is settling. Um, we were at, I think 38 units. Um, I've decided to sell off two of uh, my existing single family rentals. Okay. Um, so that brings the total down to 36, but yeah, we came out of the gate really strong and then picked up, uh, whatever the math is on that 11 doors in the last three months. So, uh, the goal for me this year is to get to 50 units, 50 doors, and I'd like to get to 10,000 a month. And, uh, nice. very, very cool. Well, strong start to the year. Very proud of you, uh, being a role model for not only myself, but for other people, Jason, uh, I don't know if you see that, but, uh, you clearly are. And to that end, you run a meetup group in Fresno that had a huge turnout earlier in the week. And that's why we wanted to do this video because we wanted to record the content. Uh, also uh, set it up because I will be coming in behind you next month uh, to feed into this. So why don't you set up what the event was while I uh, bring up the PowerPoint for you here. Go ahead. Sure. So we, like you said, we do a, a, a local meetup for, uh, for real estate investors and just industry professionals. Um, uh, the, the group has been growing and we're getting uh, on average about 90 to 100 people. And we started a couple months ago, a three part series on how to finance your next deal. And the first piece or first part of that series was uh, talking strictly on hard money lending and kind of the ins and outs of using hard money, as I think that's um, what most investors kind of use as their first option, you know, when you're not seasoned and you don't have a track record. So I started with that. And then this last Monday, uh, we moved on to raising funds from private investors. And it's such a topic of conversation and, and it yields a lot of interest. So I think, uh, you know, it makes sense for you to come in and, and kind of expound on that and not just, uh, you know, uh, go off of, you know, my experience, but also your experiences over the last 15 years and how you've been able to capitalize uh, um, on using uh, private, uh, private funds. So that's what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, there's no question. Private money... Um I've used it significant. I've used it to the tune of seven figures at two different times in my 15 year run. The first time uh, was kind of like 2010 through 12. Uh, basically, the banks weren't lending to me anymore. Uh, I had, like you, tried hard money because it was kind of like a bank, but you know, a lot more expensive. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'm like, "You idiot!" Right? Tap into your network. Use your network for private money. There's there's people throwing money at you if you put it together right. So uh, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be fun to talk to you. So let's just jump into the PowerPoint here and um, have you sort of go through it and um, 
we'll get we'll go from there. Sure. Yes, yeah, so this is kind of introductory slide. We can move on over to the next one. I am trying. Why does why does return work once and now it doesn't? All right. You think we we practice this, people? I promise. <laughs> one more time. <laughs> the tech never works when we need it to. I'm sure we'll get it figured out. We can edit it all out. There we go. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. You see it? All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I can do three-part series, hard money, private money, creative financing. This slide deck is going to talk specifically about number two, private money, so you can click over to the next one. Um, the way that I, I kind of prefaced the even the hard money presentation, and I, and I did the, uh, the same thing with, with the presentation this last week on private money, was what you kind of need to get started. Mm -hmm. and some of the things that you need before you even start approaching people. Um, so you can click over to the next one and we can talk about those things. So what I told the group, and, and here's just kind of my thought process. If you're borrowing from a hard money lender or a private money lender, I think you have to have some things in place um, to kind of bridge the gap, right? And, and so I talk about having access to working capital. And when I say working capital, I, you know, I've got some examples there on the screen. Um, to me, those are things like cash reserves, just cash that you have in the bank, um, money that you have in a retirement account, access to lines of credit or credit cards, or if you've got money in the stock market uh, that you can pull out. And, and the way that I use these, uh, these funds is basically to act as a, as a bridge. So in case your project runs over budget or you hold the property for a little bit longer than you're expecting or just something happens. You have to have something there that acts as a safety net. You don't want to be completely over leveraged and have your bank account down to zero because uh, yeah. that can be a very scary situation. And so, um, you know, I think before you approach anybody, especially a private individual about borrowing money from them, you got to make sure you have, you know, one or, or multiple of these things on your, on your checklist uh, taken care of. Yeah. And I would agree. I don't, I don't, I don't recommend anybody seek uh, investments from, from private, you know, from friends and family, right? Private investors where, you know, you're so strapped that one wrinkle um, could cause a, a failure and kind of a cascading effect, right? Having the reserves, you know, even if you don't have any of your money, quote unquote, in the deal, you've got to be able to backstop it without seeking additional capital or robbing from Peter to pay Paul or any of that stuff that we've seen go on in, in, in the histories. So yeah, if you're going to be closing on properties and, and fixing them and reselling them or wholetailing them or buying and holding, you got to have, you got to have some of this working capital available. I use the, my retirement account. Mm -hmm. So what I did when I first started was I had an old uh, employer funded account at Fidelity. I converted that into a solo 401k and it was an account that I could borrow, uh, you know, either 50,000 or up to 50% of what was in there. And I used that kind of as my seed money on the very first project that I did. That's and, uh, that's, and that's what I did. And so I, I, I cautioned the group that I, that I spoke to on Monday that if you don't have these things, there's other options. You can wholesale the property and, and start to build up some of the capital that you have. You can take on a, a joint venture partner who's going to take care of the money side of it and you manage the project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's other things that you can do, but uh, like you said, I would not, if you don't have any type of reserves or access to working capital, it can get, uh, you know, a little bit hairy if things get sideways on you. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that. So we can go on to the next one. Uh, so the next slide is going to talk about, I guess, my definition of what a private money lender is. You can click over to that. And... In, in my experience from borrowing from private money lenders, and I'm not an expert by any means, but uh, I would say for the last 24 months, I've, I've been using strictly um, funding from private money lenders. I'm not really using hard money lenders anymore. I've been able to develop enough relationships where I can go to individuals that I've met. And so this is the definition of the people that I guess that I'm working with. Um, it's a loan from a private individual who's willing to fund your deal in exchange for some type of return on their investment. And those individuals for me have been um, you know, friends, family, coworkers, colleagues, uh, people that I've met at networking events, people that have seen my track record on social media and different things. And either I've approached them or they've reached out to me. And, uh, you know, we've just sparked up a conversation about funding my deals. And, uh, you know, it's, it's worked out really well. 
Yeah, and again, you're just, you're being you're being modest and humble, which is you know obviously a, tr- a trait that endears you to lots of people, including myself. Uh, but what you said there is very subtle: is track record. Um, you know, that's one of the things that people are going to hear next month when I speak. Is that's one of the first things you have to build up, right? If you don't have any of the first slide, right, any of that money reserves, all of that, you do build up a track record via wholesaling or wholesaling or whatever you want to call that. But document everything. Document what you found, document what happened, document what people won, how everybody, how everybody profited, because that's what people want to see. Um, Absolutely. You know, and then go to meetups and network because you will be shocked at the number of people uh, that are willing to participate in this because they don't have time, but they have money earning nothing in the bank. And if they can partner with someone who's a proven entity, i.e. Jason in this example, and also get a, an asset-based secure return uh, that's you know short-term, call it sub six months, man, it doesn't get better than that for, for most people. So uh, this really does work. Yes, I agree. And, and, and you hit it on the head. I think uh, for me, all the, the individuals that I work with, they're going to look at the deal first. So they're going to focus on whether or not it's actually a legitimate deal that has some room in there and that offers them, um, them some protection in case something goes wrong. Uh, but what I found um, is that it's really the track record. They're going to look at you and they're going to say, hey, show me what you've done. And like you said, have you documented it? Do you have a schedule of the real estate projects that you've worked on for the last you know, year or two years? Do you have your closing statements from when you bought it and from when you sold it? And can you show me either a profit and loss or some type of accounting for what you spent on the property, right? And if Mm -hmm. you can provide those things, it shows a certain level of professionalism and it shows that, you know, you're, you're actually taking time to, to, to run a a legitimate business. And I think that that lends to the credibility and, and to that track record that you're talking about. Yeah. And this one last thing, and let's just think you're the, you're 24 years old, you're out of school or, or whatever, you don't have any money to do a flip yet, but you are, you're a bird dog or you're door knocking or whatever you're doing. Even if you just say, hey, I found one, two, three Main Street, sold it to Jason, made a thousand bucks, but look at what Jason did with it and he made 30 grand. If you, even if that's all you can show, if you can show a dozen of those, you're eventually going to get somebody in Jason's position to go, hey, let me joint venture with you and why don't you and I, you know, do a 2010 split, and, you know, so. Um, I agree. Yeah, that's a, that's a skill set that brings a lot of value because finding deals is one of the most important pieces. It's the biggest piece of the puzzle right now. So if you can yeah. prove that you can find deals that pencil out and make people money, there's going to be a lot of people lining up to talk to you. So I, I agree 100%. Yeah, if you can find a deal in this market, if, that's the one skill that works no matter if the market's hot or cold. Uh, if you can pick that trade up first or that skill first, money will not be a problem. Trust me. Yep, that's right. All right, so we can move on to the next uh, next slide here. So uh, this next portion is going to talk about just the price and terms uh, that you can expect, and and specifically what I'm paying right now. So we can move to the next one, and we can talk about that. Uh, what I like about dealing with with private individuals and and private money lenders is that everything is negotiable. Uh, so when you go to hard money, usually the the rate and terms are already established or set based on what the hard money lender is is comfortable with right and um i like dealing with private money lenders because you can go to them and um you can just say hey listen this is the type of deal that i would like to negotiate this would be what i'm looking for is that something that's fair for you and if it is then great and if not then you know you can come up with something that's mutually beneficial and works for everybody so i really like the flexibility that comes with working with an individual and not uh, maybe a, a company or something like that. Um, the loans are going to be, they're going to be penciled out and underwritten, I think, similarly to the way a hard money lender will look at it, right? So they're going to look at, you know, the loan to value. They're going to look at what you're paying for it and how much you're putting into it. So I think it always goes back to what we said in the last slide. It's the quality of the deal. And if the deal is not a good deal, then, um, you know, I wouldn't expect a lot of people to be throwing money at you. So I would say you got to start with the deal and it's got to be a legitimate deal. Yeah, there's no question. And again, everything negotiable is so, so dead on. For example, the first time I went private money, it was right after I think Bear Stearns or somebody went out of business or you know maybe six months after that and literally nobody was lending. But also savings accounts were paying less than 1% interest. Yeah. 
So what we did the first time with private money is we just gave 10% interest only firsts with 10 year um, locks because, and people are fine. So we just did long-term holds the first time, you know, today it's very common to do six months or less because you know, you're getting in and out, you're doing burr, whatever. Um, You know, something for you to think about Jason is you might actually, because right now you're, you're borrowing at, you know, double digits. Mm -hmm. Um, you actually might want to talk to some of your investors and see if anybody wants to loan at 6% interest only or something. And then you don't have to refi out. Um, because I've, I've done that in the past. So just something. Uh, and I think he's been on your show. Alan does that. And, uh, he's kind of uh, schooled me to that a little bit. And he's got a, a few people that he works with that he does that on some of the longer term projects, especially when he's borrowing bigger chunks of money. Um, everything makes sense and the cash flow still work out. So I agree. Yeah. I think, uh, what I'm doing is, uh, for the lack of a better word, pretty cookie cutter. It's in, and, and yep. I'll talk through it right now. Um, you know, I'm borrowing at, depending on the, on the individual and the relationships that's, that's there. Uh, it's at eight to 10% interest. I'm not, I'm not paying any more than 10% right now. Uh, but it usually varies between eight to 10. Um, and again, depending on the individual, there's either no points or one point up front. Um, not really paying anything more than that. Um, there are shorter term loans, usually, uh, right now it's about six months. If it's a single family house, whether I'm going to flip it or I'm going to burr out of it, it's six months with an optional three month extension, just in case, you know, we need to buy a little bit extra time. And there's usually some kind of, uh, you know, fee or something paid if I exercise the extension to make everybody happy and, mm-hmm. and then the continue to, to go on. So, and, and again, these are all, these are all things you work out with your relationship or your friend and family. Some people, you know, some people want, you know, again, right. Some of my friends want to point up front, but then I pay them lower interest and others are like, I don't care. Just, you know, pay me X. And these are all things you get to talk about. That, that first bullet, everything is negotiable is, is right on. And yeah. the more, the more of these you do and the more that you return, you can actually, I don't know if demand is the right word, maybe offer even lower uh, because people right. want to get um, confidence in you. And that's what, and that's what I found. It's funny that you mentioned that, uh, you know, once, once you get a few deals under your belt, everybody kind of gets used to that check coming in. Right. And then, uh, if you know, I, I pay off a loan and I don't go back to them right away, they may put out, you know, a call or a text and say, Hey, when are we going to do another deal? And I'll say, well, you know what, I, I got, you know, some money placed with another individual. It's giving me some, some better terms right now, but on the next one, I'll let you know. And then when we sit down and talk about the next one, you know, I'll say, Hey, this is what I'm getting on this. Are you open to, you know, doing something like that? Right. And so just to try to keep everybody honest, right. You know, like you said, everything's a negotiation and it it never hurts to ask. And, um, you know, every, um, you know, everything that you can do to to save a few bucks always helps. So, uh, you know, just for, for the sake of clear numbers, I would say based off of the the figures we were talking about for every hundred thousand dollars that I'm borrowing, I'm usually paying, let's say a thousand bucks to do the loan. Right. Around 850 bucks a month interest only, let's call it like that, every single month. And then when I pay them off, the investor gets their 100,000 back at the payoff, plus their return is just the interest plus that fee. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So pretty simple and straightforward and easy. Everybody understands that. And that's what I like about it too, because you know a lot of it you're dealing with friends and family and different people, and they're not like they're these crazy stock market whizzes. So when you <laughs> do simple math with that, and you can say, hey, you can make five, six grand, without really having to do anything besides write me a check, you know, are you open yeah. to that? And they're like, yeah, sure. So. Very cool. Yep. All right. So we can move on. So this next piece is, um, it, it says how to manage rehab funds and it's, it's talking specifically, I'm going to talk specifically about just structuring the loan and how you, um, and how you, uh, you know, put everything together to, to cover the, the, the total project costs. You can click over to the next one. So what I like to do when I'm borrowing my funds, um, and again, this is contingent on, on a good deal, but obviously I, I don't like to bring marginal deals to anybody. So if I ever bring a deal to somebody, I, I feel confident that there's, there's room in there and it's a solid deal for everybody. I like to borrow uh, 100% of my total project costs, meaning if I'm buying the, the, the property for 100 grand, I'm accounting for 25,000 in rehab, and then let's say I'm accounting for seven grand in, you know, holding costs. I'm going to come for a loan somewhere in the neighborhood of about 132 to 135, if those mm-hmm. numbers make sense, right? Yep. And that's what's really allowed me to scale up the amount of projects that I've been doing. 
um, because when you're you're kind of you're you're kind of uh, hamstrung when you deal with hard money lenders because they want they want more skin in the game they want big chunks of money down and at the beginning I was putting twenty percent down and funding the rehab all out of pocket you know that's fifty sixty grand per deal mm -hmm. and you run out of money really quick when you're doing it that way so when I first started I would only do two or three projects at a time and now I'd say for the last two years we're, we're actively managing you know eight to ten different projects at once that we've got on the books. So, um, you know, utilizing loans that are structured that way has really helped. Yeah. And I would caution any new person going after this, this may not be the first thing to do. Cause again, it's about track record and success and all of that. That's I great. personally, right. And, and again, we're in different financial places. I get it. Uh, but I always borrow the purchase price and then I fund the repairs myself. Um, yeah, and and I didn't start that way either with with all of the private lenders. So that's another that's another caveat, I guess. Is I I didn't go to the very first person that I met. Yeah, and say, hey, give me all the money that <laughs> I need, right? You know what I mean? It didn't work like that. It's just like anything else. Yep, you've got to have a track record, right? But once you get five, six, eight, ten, a dozen of these things under your belt, yes. at that point they're looking at the deal and they're vetting the deal, but they're really betting on their relationship with you. And now I've got a lot of trust established and I've paid them a healthy return over the last year or two. Right. Yep. And so just like anything else, it's training wheels and you kind of have to work your way up to that. So I like to structure my deals like that, but mm -hmm. if you're brand new and it's a new relationship, you, you may not be able to get terms like that right out of the gate. And again, I would tell you if it's a new relationship and it's your first one, don't plan for a hundred percent of the costs. Um, because when you do that, it can smell like desperation and that's really what turns off, I'll call them deep pocket or money investors, right? What, what they're looking for when they meet you is, is, is that track record, which we've already talked about. Uh, they're looking to protect their downside. What's the downside known, right? It, it, worst comes to worst, what happens? And then next one, they want to make sure um, that you are in a financially strong position that you can weather some errors. Hence the first slide that Jason put up about having reserves, you know, the just in case it took an extra month or something was more expensive than you thought. Um, you just got to, you got to remember, you have to put yourself in the lender's shoes, your friend, right? Who's going to cut you a $132,000 check. What, what are they going to be thinking? Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's a good segue to the other points. If you're not going in asking for a hundred percent or you can't get a hundred percent, that's where that, that working capital that we talked in at the beginning, that's where that comes in. Right. And so you, you have access to those funds and you say, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm, I, I, I'd like a loan for a hundred, which is better than what you're going to get for the hard money lender. They're not going to give you the entire purchase price. So I'd Absolutely. like a loan for the, for the hundred thousand dollars to buy it. And then the 25 grand to fix it and the seven grand that I need to hold it and cover the debt service, I'm going to cover that out of my pocket. Right. And it shows that, like you said, you've got, you're financially viable and secure enough to cover that and, and make sure and uh, you know, you're, you're able to, to keep up with your, uh, your end of the bargain. Um, yeah. And just the last thing is don't think you're going to jump into this and do 10 deals all at one time. You treat that first one like it's a precious gold egg and you're not going to want to drop it, right? You got to do right. everything you can to make it a success. Also document the whole way through, right? Document the rehab, document the, the demolition, document the, the flooring. I mean, just, People have to feel like there's an evolution to what you're doing and it's just not smoke and mirrors. Correct. And even with even when investors don't ask for it on the first few deals, I like to try to keep them updated throughout the process, right? I mean, I think ultimately, you know, the, the biggest thing is making sure that that check shows up on time when you say it's going to show up, right? Because if it doesn't, you're going to get a call for sure. But mm -hmm. if you are, like you said, being proactive and saying, here's where we're at in the rehab process, we've got you know, this, this, and this left on our scope of work. And then we're getting ready to be listed by the end of the month. I'll send you listing pictures when we're done. Right. It looks like you're, you know, it doesn't look like it. You are being a professional and, and, and treating it like a business and, and respecting everybody's time. So, yeah. um, yeah, I think that's good. I think some of the things that I've done, um, it, beyond just using working capital is if I have investors that want to loan maybe smaller amounts, you can put that in second position. Yep. Uh, as long as the, the senior lien holder is okay with it and you tell them, Hey, listen, you know, I'm going to do this. I've got somebody that's been itching to, to lend, but they've only got enough to cover rehab costs. Um, you know, you can put that in second position and, and, and do that as an alternative as well. Good call. All right. Um, this was a big one. And, and this was where we had a lot of questions with the group was finding private money lenders. So that's what we're talking about next. 
So for pri- building relationships with private money lenders, I, for me, it always starts with asking, right? And I think that the thing that you'll see with me is I'm very consistent with this. Whenever I've been on your channel, whenever I get up in front of my group of investors in the meetup organization that I run or any other place where I go and there's an introduction, I'll always kind of throw that in and say, hey, this is what I've got going on. Got a lot of deals kind of coming through the pipe right now. Um, if there's anybody interested on getting a return and lending money, come please talk to me. And that's how I got the relationships that I started with. The first handful of people were people that I met that were complete strangers to me, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, we met each other at, at networking events and we talked and it looked like there was some mutual interest. We sat down and had some lunch, talked a little bit more, got to know each other a little bit more, uh, started sending some deals their way. And, um, you know, they pulled the trigger on them and that's how, that's how it started. And I think it, that all goes back to asking. If you don't ask, you're ne- nobody's ever going to know. People don't, are, you know, they're not able to read your mind. So you have to do that. Yeah. And again, this, what you have here is um, utilizing social media or a credibility packet. These are the things that I coach all new people to think about. Again, back to that 24-year-old self who has no money. If you can just document a deal, you know, if you document, if you found 12 good deals, even if you only earn a thousand bucks on each one as a bird dog or referral fee or whatever that is, if you can prove that you can find deals, money is not going to be the problem. But you have to document, share, and then ask, right? Don't just assume that first one, all caps. I love it. You have to ask. Um, Yeah. It, 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 and for me, there was a big mindset shift that had to take place in understanding the value that I was bringing to the investor. And once I was really savvy enough to understand like why I'm paying these hard money lenders 10, 11, $12,000 off of every single deal that I'm doing, I did, you know, a, 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 let's call it eight to 10 deals. And I realized why wow, I paid these guys 120, $130,000 over those deals. Right. Yeah. And so... Uh, I would go to the investors and I would say, hey, I'm going to pay this hard money lender $13,000 to do this deal. I'd rather pay you that money if you're open to coming up with something that's, you know, maybe a little bit more favorable if I don't have to put up all of them. You know what I mean? Right. And so it starts like that. And then that's how it goes. And I I realized um, that I was bringing a lot of value to the table by finding the deal, putting the deal under contract, running the contractors, putting everything together, getting it sold. Right. And so. I think I had a mindset shift and that came with confidence and that confidence came with the track record that we're talking about. Yeah. Let's just be clear. You, you are giving investors an annualized return in a secured position north of 20%. Yep. That's what you're giving them. It's secured against an asset that has value that you're only adding more value to. Correct. You know, so what I tell all of people that loan me money is you hope I get hit by a bus. Now, you don't need to be morbid and you know, all of that, but you know what? If I do die or get hit by a bus, everybody who's lent me money is in a better position because they get an asset. In a financial situation, they're be- yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're better off, right? So I think um, I agree with you 100%. And I, and I say something very similar to that. I say struck by lightning instead of hit by a bus. <laughs> Believe it or not, I said, if, I, if I get struck by lightning tomorrow, you get the house and you get to sell the house and, and make the lion's share of the money on this deal, right? You know what exactly. I mean? And so, um, you know, it's true. And I think it's best for everybody, obviously, if you perform and, and, and you establish kind of a long-term relationship. Um, but I think it starts with asking yeah. and um, you've got to be okay with talking. I think sometimes people are scared to talk to the, their closest friends and family because they, they're worried about what they're going to think. Right. Yeah. And I think you have to talk to your friends and your family and your coworkers. I did a lot of presenting at networking events and I would just go to every single meetup that was in town. And I didn't go to the first meetup and talk to them without being there and knowing anybody and saying, hey, can I come to your meetup and present? I took some time to meet the people that were organizing it and I added value. And then after some time, I started having them come in. Um, Social media has been a big thing for me because I think people can look at a video that we do or see me at a meetup, then pull my Facebook page and see a big track record of all of the projects that I've done over the last two years, right? Exactly. But if they type in Jason Pritchard into Facebook and it's an avatar with a blank picture and there's nothing on there, yeah. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't add a lot of credibility to what you're doing, right? So I think social media um, is, is a great tool to, to not only just document the stuff that you're doing, but add some credibility. And I do have a, 
a formal credibility packet. I took some time. It's eight to 10 pages. It's got, you know, some information about me and my company. It's got that schedule of real estate. It's got what a potential deal funding request looks like. And then it's got before and afters of a lot of the projects that I've done. Uh, so I give that to, you know, everybody in person or via email if it's a new, uh, a new relationship. So they have something tangible that they can look at. So. Yeah. And just one thing you said or said in there that's subtle, I don't want people to miss is the power of social media isn't necessarily today's post. It's the fact that people can go Jason Pritchard and then look at two years of his history and see, see deals that were done last year this time. That's what I mean by documenting people, right? Document the deal you found, walk it through, show the pictures and then do the next one and the next one. And then somebody comes in that you meet and go, Hey, go look at my page. You can look at the last five deals I've done. Now you have some power, right? They're going to go spend an hour without talking to you and make up their mind sure. before they call you. Absolutely. So very, very cool. All right. So you had a case study. Yeah. So, um, as part of the, as part of the meetup on Monday, we had a case study that showed what a formal funding request looks like. All of the things that I put into, into that request, um, the credibility packet was part of it. It shows, uh, with all the in private information redacted, but literally the email that I sent to the lender saying, here's what the, it's as simple as this. I send an email with these documents. This is how I proposition everything. We go back and forth. We agreed. This is the email that goes to the title company to um, get them to draft up the deed of trust and the promissory note and all of those things. Here's the closing statement when I bought it. Here's a P&L from QuickBooks that shows what I put into it. Here's the closing statement when I sold it. Here's everything so you can really see, um, you know, from start to finish what it looks like and the things that are involved. I think people uh, overcomplicate things and it actually is simpler um, than what most people think. And it's, uh, you know, there's a fear and intimidation factor at the beginning, but I wanted to show them that, you know, hey, once you do this, um, you know, there's a, a big opportunity to, to go and do more stuff if, you're, if you know what you're doing. Very cool. And then you close with your, your page. Look at that good looking guy right there. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So again, if anybody's got questions or uh, wants to reach out or is interested in lending on uh, any of the stuff that I've got going on, my number's right there. Uh, I, I really am trying to grow my social media presence on, on Facebook and, and Instagram. So that's a good way to connect with me and, uh, you know, see some of the stuff that I have going on and, and engage with me and, uh, yeah, if I can help anybody with anything and add value to anybody, please uh, feel free to reach out. Very cool, Jason. That was really cool. So uh, setting up uh, next month, what, what do we agree on? May 6th? Is that what we said? Yeah, 6th of May. Uh, the meetup will be held in the, at the Iron Key Real Estate Brokerage here in Fresno. Um, the, if you go to meetup.com and just search real estate, uh, I'm the organizer for the Central California Real Estate Investing Group. There's about uh, just under a thousand members right now, and we're usually averaging somewhere between 90 and 100 people turning out. So we get a really solid turnout, and it's a good mix of people that are new, uh, as well as seasoned investors, um, yeah, attorneys, handymen, general contractors, lenders, uh, hard money lenders, private lenders, anybody that you know, kind of fills a, a, a niche in, in this business, they're there. So if you're, if you're looking to, to, uh, to, to build your network out, it's a, great, uh, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, and just to tease what I'm going to put together for you again with Jason's guidance is uh, I really look at private lending as a triangle, for lack of a better term, basically a three-legged stool, whatever. It's, it's about you, you know, the person seeking it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the lender and it's the deal. And it's those, how those three things all have to operate together. And what I thought we would do is we're, I'm going to bring a couple of deals or properties to the table. So I'm imagining giving 20, 25 minutes of talk, education, walkthrough, but then we're going to do some in-class, I don't know, I don't know what you call it, homework or assignments. We're going to yeah, exercise. Yeah, sure. exercise. There you go. Sure. Right. We're going to, we're going to get uncomfortable. We're going to be used to being uncomfortable, comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, yeah. Because I, I think we all have to look at deals and really talk about them and maybe get some people up to present or something. Um, but I, I think there's nothing better than actually looking at a deal. And in worst case, Jason and I will just do it together in the front of the room and, and give it a shot. So um, sure. it, it'll be a lot of fun. 
Uh, and as always, we, we're, Jason and I are very open to answering any and all questions. So uh, we will see all of you on May 6th at Iron Key. Great. Any Thanks last, any last uh, comments, Jason? No, man, I appreciate it. Again, uh, you know, let me come on your platform and, and share my story and, uh, you know, add value to people that are, uh, that are interested in investing. I know it's something that you and I are really passionate about. And, uh, you know, I, I love talking to you about this stuff, man. So I'm looking forward to seeing you next month. You got it, brother. Take care of yourself. Thanks again. Cool.